There we go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Carving It Up Live on Facebook, Live, YouTube, and on Twitter. I had the mic muted there. My bad. Glad the uh, stream StreamYard uh, app alerted me of that. I am Bryson Carver, as always. We are presented by The Grid, and do we have a packed show for y'all tonight? Got some, uh, well, some, a lot of NFL. We got some NBA sprinkled in there. Uh, I'm looking at my phone and my notes. We've got one, two, three, four. We've got seven topics for today's show. Obviously, at the end of the show, one more game to kick to close out week 16. Colts, Chargers, Chargers can clinch a playoff berth. The Colts, hey, it's it's a, it's another Jeff Saturday game, and Nick Foles is going to start at quarterback. So we'll see how that plays out tonight on ESPN. I'll predict that at the end of today's show. Plenty of evidence now at this point that Mac Jones is not only a bad quarterback, not only is he a bad teammate, but apparently he's a dirty player. I'll discuss that later in the show as well as my Golden State Warriors kicking the teeth of the Memphis Grizzlies after the Grizzlies were talking all kinds of smack for the last two weeks leading up into this game. I'll talk about that as well as some of the other Christmas Day mac matchups. Nathaniel Hackett fired from the Denver Broncos. Didn't even get an opportunity to complete a full season as the team's head coach. I'll let you know whether it was his fault, Russell's fault, both's fault, everybody's fault. A lot of blame to go around in Denver, Colorado, especially after whatever that was yesterday in Los Angeles. And also discuss Packers, Dolphins. What a Wild game that was. Uh, you know, listen, it was, it was nuts. It was, it was a crazy game. My man Patrick Brown, host of the Chaotic Sports Podcast here on The Grid, says, first time the comments. Patrick, it is great to see you here in the comments. Uh, and you're going to like this first segment. I, I have a good feeling about that. There's no other way to start the show with what happened in Arlington, Texas on Saturday evening, afternoon, whatever time uh, you are in the country. The Dallas Cowboys beat the Philadelphia Eagles by a final score of 40 to thir uh, 34, almost a 13, 40 to 34. And uh, listen, it was a game that was actually, if I were a Batman game, so I now fall to 6 and 10 in that group. So I've clinched a losing record for the season, and I'm not happy about it. But the more important aspect coming from this game uh, stems around one man and one man only. You know his name. Say it with me. Say it loud and say it proud. Rain Dakota Prescott just tore up the second best defense in the National Football League. 347 yards passing, completed 77% of his passes. Three touchdowns, a QBR of 124. I'm sorry, a pass ring of 124, a QBR 0 to 100 of 80. Six, may I remind you, against the second-ranked pass defense in professional football. Despite what, hey, listen, I've been defending Dak's interceptions all season long. The majority of them have not been his fault. Cannot defend the, the interception he threw on Saturday evening. Threw right to sweat. He missed, Dak talked about it after the game. He misjudged uh, Sweat's length. He should have floated it more to Schultz. It was a bad throw, bad decision, bad mistake. After that, Dak Prescott was flawless in that game. Let's look at some of his throws. We got the film. We got uh, some of the, the, the tape cleaned up. It having some issues on the show here. But here we go. Let's look at some of uh, Dak Prescott's throws. So this is what really got to start. He's under pressure. Oh, he's going to get sacked. He's going to. Oh, my goodness. He completed a Michael Gallup on a big third down and five to keep the drive alive. Couple possessions later, third down and six. I heard Dak can't throw it over the top. He does to CeeDee Lamb. Touchdown, Dallas. All right, so that's that puts the Cowboys up. They're down three now. Jaws a man off sides, pulls an Aaron Rodgers right down the pipe. The C.D. Lamb once again, who had a big afternoon. Talking about him later. Here's another shot. Bam, right to Dalton Schultz. Sets them up in the red zone inside the 10. This might have been Dak's best throw of the day. Rolling to his right. And bam, finds Michael Gallup. Touchdown, Dallas. I'll stop right there. Because I've talked about Dak, and a few quarterbacks in the NFL are better at making plays outside of the pocket than Rain Dakota Prescott. He showed you that on the pass to Michael Gallup on that touchdown. Uh, again, finding CeeDee Lamb over the top. CeeDee Lamb was, listen, I've been critical of this man all season long. Ever since the two interceptions that, to me, were his fault against Green Bay, he's been outstanding. Yesterday against the Philadelphia Eagles, and mostly Darius Slay, one of the better corners of the league. Ten catches, a buck twenty. Not one, but two touchdowns. The second one we'll show in just a second. But what I loved about this game as a Dak fan, not a Cowboy fan, but a Dak fan, 
what I loved about this is the fact that Dak Prescott comes in with all the noise about the interceptions, but a couple things in particular. He can't win without a run game. Well, that's funny. If it weren't for Dak Prescott, the Cowboys would not have rushed for 100 yards. Dak gave you 41 on the ground, including some big rushes late. And secondly, you can't win when Dak Prescott throws over 30 times. Well, through uh, well, it was 35 passes against two of the best corners in the NFL. With CeeDee Lamb, I'll give you CeeDee Lamb. Okay, kid is slowly developing into a true number one receiver. I've been critical of him. First half of the season, he's been excellent ever since. Still not sold on Michael Gallup, though. I'm darn sure not sold on Noah Brown. Dalton Schultz played a nice game yesterday, or Saturday night. Eh, still not a tight end that you trust in the biggest spots. All of the notions about Dak Prescott, he's a reckless quarterback. Made all kinds of tight window throws yesterday. He was 24 for 24 in zone coverage, folks. Perfect. But when the game was on the line, down 34-27, about eight minutes and change left, gets sacked twice to make it third down and 30. He makes the play of the game. And folks, I'm just here to tell you, if this had been Burrow, Mahomes, or Allen, the internet would have exploded. But because it's Dak Prescott, not the case. Third down and, again, 30. Dak Prescott pulls. Do we have it here? Here it is. The throw to T.Y. Hilton. Look at this. Moving the pocket, stepping up, and launching a bomb. 60 yards through the air, highest of his career. It hits T.Y. Hilton over the top. And then a couple plays later, gets out of pressure, finds Tony Pollard, gets him inside the 10-yard line. Here's the touchdown that tied it. Again. Couldn't have thrown it any better to CeeDee Lamb. Makes a great catch. The end zone, a great route. Touchdown, Dallas. They tied it. Got two field goals after that, thanks to some turnovers forced by the Cowboys' defense, which I'll get to a little later in this segment as well. But every single big play that needed to be made, Dak Prescott made it because that's what he's done for seven years of his NFL career. This is what I've been saying since day one. What he pulled off, I don't think he's getting enough credit for this against the best team in the NFC. Okay, with Jalen Hurts, that's the best team in the NFC. Speaking of Jalen Hurts, I know there's a lot of things. Well, Dak Prescott didn't beat the Eagles when they had Jalen Hurts. I didn't know Jalen Hurts was a pass rusher, a outside linebacker, a number one corner. Did, did not know that. Uh, nobody told me. I must, not been, I must have not been watching enough Eagles game. Okay? On the second right pass defense football, Dak Prescott hung 40. 40, by far the most the Eagles have given up this season. Dak Prescott is the only 300-pass yard game that the Eagles have given up this season. The highest QBR against the Eagles. The highest passer rating against the Eagles all season long. He's outstanding. If there were any doubts about whether this man is an elite quarterback, is a top 10 quarterback, they were silenced on Saturday night. Because in one of the biggest games the Cowboys have had in probably the last six, seven years, and really ever since Dak has been there, you needed him. You, you, you desperately needed him to play basically perfect. And after the first interception, flawless. Couldn't have played better. Almost 80% of his passes were completed. Well over 300 yards, three tutties. Pass rating of 124 QBR of 86. Rain. Dakota Prescott. Hats off. Hats off. Got to give you a standing ovation. If I had room to do it, I'd give you a standing ovation. That was remarkable. What I love about Dak Prescott, too, he's obviously a remarkable quarterback, um, a remarkable leader, an A++ human being. He's nominated for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the second straight year and for the third time in his career. We, we get all that about Dak. But I didn't know that Dak had a little sense of humor. This is what he said to start his press conference because he knows the narrative. Listen, Dak can tell you. These athletes can tell you. I say it all the time. Oh, we're just tuning out the noise. No, no, no. no. They're listening to every word of the noise. Dak Prescott, after the game, first thing he says when he goes up to the podium is... Let's start the interception. <laughs> it's the narrative. Turnover machine, this, that, and the other. Best team in the NFL. Second best defense in the NFL. With a receiving unit that outside of CeeDee Lamb, folks, is pretty darn 
average. With no run game to speak of. With, listen, defense forced four, four turnovers. Still gave up 34 points. The Cowboys needed Dak to be flawless. And he was. What a performance from one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League, Rain Dakota Prescott. Before I move on for the, to the Dallas Cowboys, we want to get to some of the few comments here. <laughs> Patrick Brown, Rain Dakota Prescott. Ryan Flowers, Clutch Sports Talk. What's up, Ryan? He says, preach, brother. But Ryan and I were texting throughout the game. He, he, you know, he and I were getting real frustrated with the Cowboys defense. Again, Ryan's the Cowboys fan in the room. I, I'm a former Cowboys fan still with Dak. Um, Patrick Brown says, when adversity rises, Dallas plays their best football. Honestly, this season, when they've had to respond to adversity, they have. You think about having you know a backup quarterback in Cooper Rush and finding a way to beat the Bengals after an embarrassing home loss to Tampa Bay to start the season. You think about, okay, their second loss was to Philly. Dak came back. They responded, beat the Detroit Lions, who now that actually looks like a pretty good win, albeit Detroit got smoked yesterday, but still a solid football team. Beat, lost to the Green Bay Packers, gave up a 14-point lead. What they do? Went to the second or third best team in the NFC and beat him 40-3. to And that was Dak's probably second best game of the season. And now this week, after the Jacksonville debacle, blowing a 17-point lead, a pick six that obviously was not Dak Prescott's fault, was Noah Brown's fault, Dak heard all the criticism and responded. And uh, Patrick Brown says, Deron Bland is a godsend. Dude was balling. Especially with the injuries you consider to Anthony Brown and to Jordan Lewis. Deron Bland, number 26. I think he's up to four or five interceptions on the season. He's been an excellent number two corner next to Trayvon Diggs. As far as the Cowboys as a team, because, you know, listen, there's a lot of win or lose. You know, it's because it's like the Lakers. It's like dude basketball. It's like the Yankees. Anything that happens is news. Okay, some of that's Jerry Jones. Some of that is just the fact that it's the star on the helmet. It's the most iconic brand in American pro sports. A lot of things that factor into that. And so there's a lot of, I think, a little bit of hysteria in the media today. Some are saying the Cowboys are the favorites to get out of the NFC. Some still don't believe in them to win a playoff game. I'm somewhere in between right now. Because as you remember, folks, when they had that 33-point fourth quarter and absolutely boat raced the Indianapolis Colts at home, I said, listen, it... As bad as the Colts are, as poorly coached the Colts are, 33 points a quarter is pretty interesting. However, they were supposed to beat the Colts badly. And so through three quarters, I was like, "Eh, I don't know. It wasn't all that impressive. But when you look at the fact, I I, I said back then, there's nothing the Cowboys can do at the time in their next two games that would convince me one way or the other about their Super Bowl contention. They were supposed to beat Houston. They did, you know, by the skin of their teeth. They were supposed to be Jacksonville, lost at the gun. I said, this game against Philly. Now, is it is a little bit of the steam taken out of the game considering Jalen Hurst didn't play? Of course. Gardner Minshew, I thought, was solid on Saturday night. Obviously not. He, he wasn't going to give them what Jalen Hurts, a healthy Jalen Hurts at least, would have given them. So, am I more confident about the Cowboys today than I was at kickoff? Absolutely. It's hard to not be. It's hard not to be confident in a quarterback who just put 40 points up on the second best pass defense in the league. It's hard to be, you know, it's hard not to be confident in a Cowboys team where penalties, for the most part, didn't kill them. It's it's really been a few weeks since penalties have been an issue for Dallas. Now I still certainly have reservations about whether or not that's going to poke, you know, uh, whether or not it's not going to poke its head out the, the curtain come playoff time. Here's why I see it with, with Dallas. They are going to have to go as far as number four takes them. I thought in order for Dallas to make a run, Dak would have to be special, but also the defense would have to be special. Well, now, Micah Parsons has been, I mean, really quiet. <laughs> as quiet as, as the mice on Christmas Eve that was Saturday. I, 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 haven't heard, I haven't heard from number 11 in a while. Demarcus Lawrence, haven't heard much from him. Obviously, the lineup was missing Leighton Vanderesh. And, you know, I hate having to do this on my show because I like the kid. And I think he's so talented. And I think his growth from year to year speaks to the work ethic that this guy has. Trayvon Diggs. He did it again. Matter of fact, he did it twice. 
He became the gambler. You got to know when to hold him. Know when to fold. He's doing it again. Got beaten a double move first drive by A.J. Brown. Almost gave up a touchdown. And got fooled badly on that fourth down play in the red zone where Devontae Smith was open by 25 yards, it felt like. <sighs> again, the film's out on Trayvon Diggs. Double move him until he shows you otherwise. That's, that's why I call him the gambler. That's why I sing Kenny Rogers in my terrible singing voice, of course. But that's why I do it. Because he he gambles every single time there's a double move. If he doesn't, he's a shutdown corner. When, when they're not double moving him, I didn't hear anything from A.J. Brown yesterday. I didn't hear anything. Outside of that, you know, that, that first drive, he was fairly quiet. It was Devontae Smith who had the big game for Dallas. Or, I'm sorry, for Philadelphia. He was excellent. Made some big time catches, caught a uh, was it two? Yeah, two touchdown passes. He, he was he was great. Looked excellent. My takeaway for Dallas is this: if that's how their quarterback has to play to win playoff games, they won't go further than round one. Again, Dak had to play one of the best games of his life. Just for Dallas to squeak by by six. The Cowboys defense forced four turnovers. They still gave up 34 points. They're struggling to get to the quarterback. Taking the ball away, that can come and go. That is, listen, so, sometimes it's contagious. And once one guy takes the ball away and another, it just becomes guys are just hunting for uh, hunting the football. But that'll come and go. Situational football is paramount once the playoffs roll around. And so. You know, I heard I've heard the saying once that to build a team to win in uh, to win a Super Bowl, your quarterback has to be as comfortable as possible, and their quarterback has to be as uncomfortable as possible. I've heard that saying before. Dallas is doing a, a decent job keeping their quarterback fairly comfortable, although there's still much to be desired in that department. Defensively, Gardner Minshew was dealing out there, and again, the two interceptions weren't bad throws. They weren't. J. Ron Curse made a great play in the first one. Deron Bland just stole the ball from Quez Watkins on the second. I thought Gardner Minshew was really good on Saturday. And I said, and I said coming in this in, in the game, listen, Hertz is obviously an MVP candidate. He's proven himself to be one of the premier quarterbacks in this league. But A, the offense is still stacked. And B, Gardner Minshew is a really good backup. If Gardner Minshew is your backup, you, you can win some games. Can you win a Super Bowl with Gardner Minshew? Absolutely not. But he can keep you alive. He can keep you afloat. But I still think there's no question the Eagles are going to win this division. They're going to win on, on, on Sunday. They're going to beat the Saints, win the division. Dallas will be locked in as the five seed. Philly will be the one seed. And then we'll just see what happens in between. So if that's the defense that you're going to get moving forward, Dallas can beat Tampa, which I'll talk about later in the show. I can't see them beating anybody else after that because they, they'd either face the Eagles again Minnesota or San Fran. I don't actually. I don't think it's a five seed. It'd be hard for them to play San Francisco. So, be that as it may, that's the only concern I have. But the takeaway from that one is that with the whole world watching, I can't wait to see what the ratings for this game was. Probably not. Maybe not the Thanksgiving ratings, which happened to be the highest rated game in NFL regular season history. But I'd say it was up. There was a pretty hyped up matchup now for two months. Dak Prescott, far and away, the number one reason the Dallas Cowboys beat the Philadelphia Eagles Saturday afternoon. Patrick Brown, by the way, Patrick Brown's also a Cowboys fan. He says it was nice to see Nick Sirianni humble on Saturday. All that smirking he did after the first meeting was nowhere to be found once Philly lost. Listen, as the old saying goes, it ain't no fun. It, it, it ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. Yeah, it's, you know, it's all fun and games when Cooper Rush is in there. It's all fun and games, the backup quarterback's in there. You got to deal with number four. You go from 17 points with Cooper Rush to a 40 burger with Dak. You can talk all you want. And, and I, I remember, listen, I, I remember criticizing Sirianni after he was talking to the Colts fans. Like, dog, you, you just beat the Colts. Like, I, I wouldn't. It was, he said it was, it was to defend his buddy Frank Reich, which I mean, very well might have been the case. But I was like, dude, I've never seen a head coach do this before in my life. Like, chill. Relax. But a good win for the Cowboys. Actually, I'd say a great win for the Cowboys. 
gives them confidence, then gives us more confidence in them. This is a 13-win team. A team that's, unless they just lay two eggs, which I don't anticipate, is going to be the, the, the number one overall seed in the NFC with eight pro bowlers, albeit one of them was out, the quarterback. Dak Prescott did his thing. I knew as soon as that game was over, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to shut up on Monday. We got to move on to new segments, but man, that felt good. As a, as a Dak fan, as a guy who was a fan of this dude before he first put on the star in the helmet, back at Mississippi State, that was special to watch. But that's what he's capable of doing any given Sunday. Is he Mahomes, Burrow, Allen? No. Some days I'm not even sure he's maybe Lamar Jackson, who I've got around four or five. But is he better than some of the other guys we consider elite? You better believe it. And he's proved it for seven years, and he proved it once again Saturday. Is that dude? They, the Cowboys got a, quick, got a quick turnaround, by the way. They got to play at Tennessee on Thursday in a game that means nothing for Tennessee. Absolutely nothing. Because win, lose, or draw, their season's going to come down to Week 18 against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Like, that game's going to decide the, the division thanks to the Houston Texans' win over the Titans. And obviously, last week, Jacksonville taking care of the New York Jets. So, definitely props to uh, to the Cowboys. And, and, and you know, they're nine-and-a-half point favorites at Tennessee. Feels about right. I'd probably put it around eight, eight-and-a-half. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's now up to 10. To my, Dallas minus 10. Uh, listen, Tennessee has nothing to play for, so I can see them coming out, nothing to lose, You know, wanting to get some momentum going into that pivotal last game that will decide that uh, AFC South. The, the South divisions this year have stunk, guys. AFC South, NFC South, the leaders in those divisions both have a 7-8 and eight record. Jacksonville and Tampa Bay, two Florida teams, uh, ironically. Let's shift, though. Let's shift, though, for those 20 minutes of Cowboys talk. Let's shift now to Christmas Day. We had three uh, compelling matchups on Christmas. One was a pretty entertaining game. One was a, a beatdown if you've ever seen one. And then the last one was about as bad a football game as we could have possibly imagined that ultimately ended up going overtime and mercifully ending on a walk-off field goal. Let's start with the first one, though. Well, I think we all, for the most part, assume would be the best game, would be the most competitive game, at least between good teams. If the Rams-Broncos are competitive, who cares? Neither team's going to make the playoffs. But as for the Dolphins and the Packers, Packers won that game. Uh, what, do I have the final score here? 26-20? Yeah, 26-20 uh, over the Miami Dolphins yesterday afternoon in South Beach in what was uncharacteristically chilly weather, which I can't say I felt that much sympathy for Miami in that they were having to deal with frigid 47-degree temperatures. When around the rest of the country, like, I mean, where I was at, it was like one. Where some people in Chicago, right, it was like negative eight. I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, ch chill, Miami. I know it's cold, but relax. But point being, as far as the game. So we got breaking news about an hour, hour and a half ago that Tua Tungavailoa is in concussion protocol again. So first of all, prayers up to Tua. Knock on wood for him. Hope he, he's able to get back soon. And, you know, obviously for Miami, this is desperate times for them. Two games to go. And. They go from a few weeks ago fighting for the number one seed to now absolutely fighting for their playoff lives. They got two games left, two division opponents, Patriots, Jets. We'll see what happens the last two games of the season. I still think Miami's uh, able to find a way to sneak in. Point being, though, two is out. That may explain some of his bad interceptions. I'll get to that in a second. Let me start, though, with Green Bay. So the Packers won. They're 7-8 and eight now. Uh, Aaron Rodgers played fairly well uh, in the game. He had a couple of plays... Uh, I know we overshot, I think it was Christian Watson on a deep ball on fourth down. He missed some throws that we're used to seeing Aaron Rodgers making. Some of that might be the broken thumb. It's Aaron Rodgers, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt in that regard. Uh, but listen, he, he, QBR of, of 31, pass ring of 76, uh, touchdown a to pick. Aaron was fine. Uh, here's what I'm looking at, though, for Green Bay. So they're seven and eight. All of a sudden, they go from dead in the water to, hang on a second, they have a, a legitimate chance to make the playoffs. They're a half game back of Washington. Washington finishes with Cleveland and Dallas. Now, 
Cleveland's virtually out of the playoffs. Dallas probably won't have anything to play for by the time that game rolls around, so we'll see. And they've also probably made a quarterback change going back to Carson Wentz after Taylor Heineke struggled against San Francisco. But you, you certainly, I, I, I don't know if anybody thinks Washington is going to win both of those games. I, I don't. Uh, and then you've got Minnesota at home on New Year's Day. And then a week after, a game that very well could decide who gets that seven seed. You played the Detroit Lions at home, a team who's beaten you. Obviously, Minnesota all the way back in week one beat Green Bay. So here's what I'm looking at for the Packers. Look, they're, they're still alive. Not just mathematically alive, they're half game back with two games to go. They, outside of Washington, control their own destiny. But if this team sneaks in, which I don't think they will, but if this team sneaks in, they're not going anywhere. Come on, man. You're watching Minnesota. Do I think Minnesota's getting to the conference title game? I don't. But what did I predict about the Vikings before the season? They would win the division convincingly, and they would win a playoff game. I feel great about that today. Aaron Rodgers does not have the weapons Kirk Cousins does. Frankly, Aaron Rodgers hasn't played near as well as Kirk Cousins has this season. I've been critical of Kirk Cousins on the show. Folks, guys played out of his mind this season. Now, he's got Justin Jefferson, but you do got to get the ball to Justin Jefferson. You got TJ Hawkinson, that offensive line running game, but it is Kirk, Kirk is, is similar to Dak in this regard. Dude gets no help from his defense, none. They're like one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL. Giants had that game tied with two minutes to go. And it took yet another game-winning drive by Kirk and that Vikings offense to win it. So I'm not confident the Packers beat the Vikings this Sunday. And if they lose, they're definitely out. There'll be nine losses. Their season will be over. But it, should they match up against Minnesota once again in the playoffs? Who do you trust? Do you trust Kevin O'Connell or do you trust Matt LaFleur? You tell me. Do you trust the guy who, who took the Vikings from one of the worst situational teams last year to one of the best this year? Or do you trust Matt LaFleur, who time and time again, come playoff time, is awful late in games? In terms of making adjustments, in terms of play calling, all of it. Do you trust this season, Kirk or Rodgers? Do you trust Devontae Adams? Uh, I'm sorry, Devontae Adams. My bad, he's in Vegas. Uh, do you trust Christian Watson? Or Justin Jefferson? Do you trust the Vikings offensive line or the beat-up Packers offensive line? I'm sorry. Green Bay can't beat Minnesota in a playoff game. They can't. Which sort of shifts me into my following point to the Dolphins. That game was more about what Miami didn't do on the offensive side of the football than what Green Bay did. So... I'm not going to be too brutal on Tua today because as it appears now, he played the fourth quarter with a concussion because the, the play where many are speculating that happened where his, again, a similar, not as violent as the first, uh, or I'm sorry, the second concussion was back in week four against the Bengals, but it's similar in that his head slammed on the turf. And that looks like a concussion happened around mid to late third quarter. But that said, are you still convinced who is a franchise quarterback? Some of those throws, folks. I mean, the great Moose Daryl Johnson was talking about it on the broadcast. I don't even know where Tua was looking with the football. I don't. But even before the concussion, you see some of those deep balls again, and it drives me nuts watching it. Tyree Kills running wide open down the field, has the angle on the safety. And he's, you know, Tyree kills the fast play in the league. He's running, he's running. Oh, crap, he's got to run back and come back and catch it. Like, almost fair catch it, almost. Underthrowing Waddle. This is what drives me crazy about Tua Tsungabailoa. Listen, he's a good kid. I've never said a bad word about him as a human being. He seems to be a good leader for that football team. They speak very highly of him in that regard. Mike McDaniel loves him. But this is now 8-2. and two beating up on Cleveland and Houston and Chicago, some like pretty darn bad pass defenses to you play the best defense of the league, San Francisco, you lay an egg. Okay. It's the best defense of football. We'll give you a, you know, this happens to most quarterbacks. You face the Niners, but then you face the chargers who are missing six defensive starters. 
and you get vastly outplayed by Justin Herbert. Last week, I had nothing but good things to say about Tua. I thought given the conditions, cold, snowy in the fourth quarter, I thought Tua played against a really good defense in Buffalo. I thought Tua played pretty well. His completion percentage didn't blow you away, but he had a couple touchdowns. He didn't turn the ball over. I thought Tua was fine. Tua put his team in position to win the game. Problem was they were facing the second or third best quarterback in the world in Josh Allen. That was their problem. But in this game, against an inferior Packers team, I don't think anybody would disagree. The Dolphins are a better football team top to bottom and certainly a better coach football team than the Green Bay Packers. They're at home. Has, have a lead. Get a turnover from Aaron Rodgers. Couldn't close the deal because of their quarterback. It's starting to look like in this four-game stretch, the Buffalo game was more the outlier than the norm for Tua in this four-game stretch. And again, some of those, th the second, the, I'm sorry, the third interception was the ultimate, I, I don't even know where he's looking with the football. The second to last drive, they're driving down the field. He throws a pick right. Was it Devondre Campbell who picked it off? Threw right to him. It was similar to Russell Wilson's interception to his old buddy Bob, Bobby Wagner. Very similar plays. I'm not sure. It, it, the linebacker is reading his eyes the whole time. Tua literally doesn't even see him, even though he's right in front of his face. Some of that might be he's an undersized quarterback, which we're seeing today. If, if there's ever a time you should be cautious about drafting undersized quarterbacks, it's now. Russell Wilson's been awful. Kyler Murray was awful, and then he got hurt. Uh, Baker, had, for the most part, I'll give Baker's flowers uh, later in the show because he played great yesterday, but for the most part, has been awful. And Tua, in the last four games, has stunk. And what's interesting about three of the last four games where Tua played horribly in. Had a chance to win the game down six in the fourth quarter to beat the San Francisco 49ers. Turnover on downs. Had a chance down six to beat the Los Angeles Chargers in the fourth quarter to win it. Punted. Was down six against the Green Bay Packers. Fourth quarter, chance to win it. Horrible interception. You seen a trend here? Two and on, where you at? Haven't heard from me in a while. You guys were all over me for the first half of the season. I, I've always said the show, there's no more pushback that I get on carving it up from any fan base than the Tua fan base. That's why I call it two and on. They're that annoying. I didn't coin that phrase. Don't worry. That, that was somebody else. I think uh, Pablo Torre or somebody came up with that uh, term to describe them. You can't defend the indefensible. He's inaccurate. He has a bad arm. He doesn't move well in the pocket. In the last few weeks, he's been a little bit of a turnover machine. He's not a franchise quarterback. We're in year three now. We're in year three. I always say the Bill Parcells rule, give the quarterback three years. First year's a developmental season. If it's second season, you want to see a, a drastic jump. If by year three, you're still not certain, you move on. If Miami doesn't have a better plan, then they can't move on from Tua. But trust me, the folks in that building know, Mike McDaniel knows, he's not the future. They can't win a Super Bowl with him at quarterback. They can't. He's like the opposite of Dak Prescott. When you need him to be at his best, he's been at his worst. When you're playing some good defenses, he's awful. Now that these coordinators have film on him, he hasn't looked like the same player. And so for Miami now, they are fighting for their playoff lives. Now, they go from being a threat to be the one seed in the stacked AFC to are they even going to get in? They're eight and seven. They're still, listen, they've still very much control their own destiny. So that's good news for Dolphins fans. But if you look at the playoff picture right now, they're up a game on New England. That game, uh, do they play New England next week? Yeah, they play New England next week. Patriots are actually favored. So probably favoring Miami, but that's, you lose that. All of a sudden, you're not in control of your own destiny. Jets are behind you. You play the Jets in week 17. Or, sorry, week 18. At the end of the day, and listen, Tua was concussed. But certainly wish him the absolute very best, especially considering how week three and week four, the back-to-back -back concussions in a five-day spam, how that turned out for him, how scary that was. And certainly wish him all the very best. But it does not change the fact that he is the reason the, the Dolphins lost the Packers yesterday. No ifs, ands, or buts. Kept putting the Packers off in a position to score. 
A lot of times, by the way, sort of back to my point about Green Bay, Green Bay was given plenty of opportunities to slam the door shut and couldn't. Like, I get it's Aaron Rodgers. I get it. We are, we, you know, we see these, these guys like Rodgers and Brady. They're not the same guys anymore. They're not, listen, it's, it's okay. They're still first ball Hall of Famers. They're still one of the 10 greatest. Obviously, Brady's the greatest, but Rodgers is one of the 10 best to ever do it. But don't let the mystique blind you. Packers are not a playoff team. A, because they're not getting in, and B, in the crazy event, in my view, the crazy event, if they do get in, they're out in round one immediately. So, come on now. Well, let's not be ridiculous about it. Let's see. Patrick Brown says, Miami should shut down Tua and let Teddy Bridgewater finish it out. Uh, I would be surprised if Bridgewater doesn't start on Sunday against New England. Uh, again, that's a team. Listen, Dolphins have owned the Patriots for the last four seasons now. I think they've lost to New England twice. And again, they play these teams twice a year. I think they've lost to New England twice in the last four seasons, ever since 2019. So, uh, listen, Miami has had plenty of success against uh, the New England Patriots. But, I, I, yeah, I'd be shocked, especially especially given the, the PR nightmare. That was the situation last year when the Dolphins lost the Bengals and Tua went down with that scary concussion, considering the fact that he was certainly concussed five day, or four days before that against the Bills, they are going to play this as conservatively as they possibly can. So, yeah, Bridge, I, I'd be shocked if Bridgewater isn't the starter on uh, next Sunday. Uh, he also says, uh, Patrick Brown says, with the Dolphins' loss, Jets are still alive as we speak. And did the R, and, and good news for the Jets, looks like Mike White, I think I read today, he's been cleared for contact. So, and I read also that Zach Wilson is going to be a, uh, is going to be inactive again. So, they, they, they don't even think Zach Wilson is good enough to be a backup. So they're just, they don't, they won't let him dress. It's like, don't put him anywhere near that number two jersey. Just, just give him a, just give him like a jacket or something. Just give him a jacket. But it's going to be Mike White the rest of the year, should he stay healthy, obviously, for the Jets. But yeah, the Jets are pretty much in control of their destiny. Because if you look at New England's schedule, the chances of them winning their last two are slim. They play the Dolphins, and then they play the Bills. And the Bills might be in position to try and get the number one seed. So they're going to play all their guys. And then they, but then it's them, Miami. Listen, it'll be interesting. I, I, I Listen, AFC stack. I mean, <laughs> Pittsburgh's still alive, technically. Mike Tomlin, that 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 uh, no losing seasons record, 15 years, again, an NFL record of, of year consecutive seasons not having a losing record, is still very much in jeopardy. But they've won two straights. They beat the Raiders on uh, Christmas Eve, obviously honored Franco Harris, game-winning drive. Tomlin is still alive. He's listen. Don't bet against Mike Tomlin getting that winning record. Getting the playoffs, I don't know. He's gonna need. They're gonna need a lot of help to do that. But hats off to the Steelers as well. But uh, I also wanted to shift to the second game, and I don't want to talk too much about the game because it was, first of all, featured two awful teams who are gonna have high draft pick. I'm, I'm sorry, Broncos are gonna have their draft pick. Seahawks got that. But Rams molly whopped the Seattle, uh, the Denver Broncos. Excuse me. 51-14. to 14. And today, a few hours ago, it was announced, it was reported, the now former head coach of the Denver Broncos, Nathaniel Hackett, was relieved of his duties. So, obviously, this is the right move to make. I said, I mean, two months ago. I mean, it was after week, like, seven. Just move on. Like, situationally, this guy's overwhelmed. He can't call plays. He's overwhelmed. And so, now the question, the national debate has kind of been, was it Hackett or was it Russ? Well, first of all, it's both. They've both been awful. Hackett's been awful situationally. Something you see, and I heard somebody say this today, sometimes with bad teams, you could still take something from it in terms of, if you watched and think about the Detroit Lions last year. They were 3 and, uh, sorry, 3-13-1 and one a year ago. Had the second worst record in all of football. Those dudes played their tails off for 60 minutes. They loved and still love Dan Campbell. They, they, they do not stop until the final whistle blows. Denver, how many sideline altercations have you seen this season with the Broncos? Offensive linemen, defensive linemen, the quarterbacks, the wide receivers, the running backs. It's been a disaster. The, listen, you can, win, you can lose games in the NFL. <laughs> it's, it is hard, it's hard to win one game in the NFL. You cannot lose the locker room. Because if it gets to the point where the team does not believe in you anymore, you're done. You can't get it back. 
That's why Doug Peterson lost his job in Philadelphia. Doug Peterson's a great coach. Great coach. But that last week of the regular season, remember this? When Jalen Hurts was playing well, Eagles had nothing to play for. They were already out of the playoffs, and he benched Jalen Hurts in favor of Nate Sudfeld, given the impression that the Eagles were tanking for a high draft pick. He was fired because the locker room, he, he lost the locker room. Some of the guys were shocked. They're like, gosh, this guy, he wrote a book called Fearless is just surrendering the last game of the season for a draft pick. I don't care about no draft pick. I'm I'm you know fighting to put food on the on the table. I don't care about no draft pick. And so he lost the locker room. I'm not sure Nathaniel Hackett didn't lose the locker room week one. With this it was a 64 yard attempt to win the game against Seattle on Monday night football in Russell's return. But what it's going to say a lot about because obviously the Broncos are way out of the playoffs. I will never forgive myself for picking this team to win the Super Bowl. Never. But they got two games left. They'll play those out. And all I could hood lose both. And then it's going to be time for a coaching search. Which, I'm, heck, I'm sure they're not already conducting that as we speak. John Elway and company in the front office. The question is now, can you find somebody to get the most out of Russ? Because Russell is never going to be the same player that he was in Seattle ever again. We The guy went from, I've never seen somebody go from a top five level quarterback, or at least, at least top 10 level quarterback, to, is this guy even a starter? The problem for the Broncos were, is they gave up two first round picks, two second round picks, and three starters. Like three high quality starters to the Seahawks for Russell Wilson and gave him the second largest deal in terms of uh, average salary per year in the NFL. Russell Wilson. Contract in total totals around a quarter of a billion dollars. They're stuck. They cannot move on from Russ until around 2026 or 27. And even, even still, they'll have a lot of dead cap money. So the search now is, can we make the most out of what we've got? Can we get the most out of one Russell Wilson? Well, listen, a lot of teams, the biggest name in the market is obviously going to be Sean Payton. Do you think Sean Payton wants the Denver job? Let's see. I don't have draft picks. Uh, the, the the roster, at least offensively, doesn't look all that great with all the injuries. Oh, yeah, and the quarterback is a terrible leader and sucks. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm totally good. I'm not going to a team that has not made the playoffs since 2015. I'm good. Dan Quinn, maybe, but would it be the right hire? Dan Quinn's a defensive coach. Defense is fine in Denver. Now, they didn't show it yesterday, but all season long, the defense has been great for Denver. It's been great. The offense can't score. Dan Quinn's not going to fix that. Kellen Moore? I don't know. He's had Dak Prescott for three years now, four years now. Doesn't have a playoff win to show for it. Uh, you sure you want Kellen Moore? You think if Kellen Moore has struggled at times with Dak, you tell me he can fix Russell Wilson? This is the most, by far, of the teams that are going to be looking for a head coach, this is by far the least attractive job. By far. At least with Carolina, you know, you, you got some talent, you got some good defensive players, you, you got draft picks that you got from the Christian McCaffrey trade, you got some, some, some assets from the Robbie Anderson trade, you can build around this. What, what do you have to build around in Denver? What do you have? So, should Ack have been fired? Obviously, guy was way over his head. Way over his head. But this still goes on the quarterback. I've seen quarterbacks win with bad head coaches before. Just look at Justin Herbert the last few years. Constantly keeping the Chargers in position to make the playoffs year in and year out with Brandon Staley, who none of us are high on. Russell is Nathaniel Hackett again. Liability, I get it. But he's looked nowhere near like the Russell that we saw for a decade in Seattle. Goes on him too. So Denver's in a obviously a bad spot. They got to try, somehow try and find a way to find a coach who can get the most out of a bad quarterback. No stands about me. Look at Russell. Let me pull up Russell's numbers this season because they're, they're obviously career lows across the board. Uh, let's see, Russell Wilson, who, by the way, was terrible yesterday. He was so bad that on the Nick broadcast, Patrick Starr, you know what's bad when Patrick Starr is ripping you, okay? Patrick Starr, Patrick Starr didn't even probably know what that term means. Uh, let's see. Russell Wilson, 15 of 27, 214, a touchdown, three interception, all three were awful. Pass ring of 54 and a QBR. Are you ready for the QBR? 
0 to 100. Russell Wilson had a QBR that equals the number on his jersey. Three. This season, Russell, 12 touchdown passes, nine picks. He is 16th in passing yards, 29th in QBR. Could Sean Payton get the best out of him? Maybe. Sean Payton's not touching Denver with a 10-foot pole. There's no way he's going to Denver. Why would he? With the option that that's got, that guy's going to have. I saw a report the other day that he's got uh, an all-star staff around him. Sean Payton is not going to Denver. They're stuck. I mean, they, they're stuck right now. Um, as for the game, though, obviously I mentioned Russell's numbers. Baker Mayfield was great. Listen, I, I'm not a Baker guy whatsoever. But listen, in two out of three starts, he's looked good. Had the game-winning drive against the Raiders. Didn't play well against Green Bay. But 24-28, 230, two touchdowns. QBR 124 and, uh, I'm sorry, pass rating of 124. QBR of 88. He's great. Uh, Baker was, was great yesterday. I can't say it. They ran the ball well. Cam Akers had his best game of the season. Over 100 yards, three touchdowns, five yards of carry. I mean, it looked a lot like the old Rams from last year. Now, obviously, the Rams are out of the playoffs, but this is what winning cultures do. When they have a season where they don't meet expectations, guys are injured, they still bring that championship mentality every single Sunday. That's why I have full confidence. Rams are going to be back next year. Super Bowl contenders, some people scoff at it. I say absolutely. Does anybody in the NFC scare you right now? If you took last year's Rams team and put them into this year, you're telling me they wouldn't be the favorites, at least them along with Philadelphia, to win the NFC. So we'll see what the Los Angeles does in the offseason. I know there's a lot of reports about Sean McVay, whether he's even going to be with the team next year. There's reports he might retire. Man, I have a hard time believing that as much passion and energy as, as he shows on the sideline and, and puts in the game every Sunday, but we'll see. <laughs> Patrick Brown says, Denver let Russ cook, and he burned the entire Christmas dinner. He, he, he burned the dinner... He, he, he didn't have enough plates. The silverware was the, the, the silverware was, was broken. He, he messed everything up. Patrick Brown says, Sean Payne to the LA Chargers would be ideal. Denver is a complete train wreck. That is, that's not the most attractive head coaching job. Like I said, it's, it's not just only that. It's the least attractive head coaching job. And again, should the Chargers, again, if they win tonight, I'll predict that game at the end of the show. Should they win tonight? They're in the playoffs. They're locked in. But if they lose immediately with Justin Herbert and that roster, you can't look at anybody else but Brandon Staley. And especially with an opportunity, if Sean Payton's interested, yeah, that's a great fit. Look he did with Drew Brees, a guy who we thought his career was over after the shoulder injury. Won a Super Bowl with him. Made a lot of Pro Bowls. Made a lot of All Pro, all pro teams. Broke a lot of records. You tell What can he do with Justin Herbert? Whew. I mean, just last year, Sean Payton won nine games using four quarterbacks, Winston, Taysom Hill. Uh, there was that one kid um, played at Notre Dame. I'm forgetting his name right now, but he played at Notre Dame. Ian, Ian Book was the quarterback. Uh, they were Trevor Simeon. I mean, they were a disaster quarterback and still almost made the playoffs last year. Sean Payton is one of the five best coaches in the NFL when he's in the NFL. He, he, he's outstanding. But yeah, that's definitely a much more attractive job, the Chargers is, uh, than Denver. Moving to the last game we saw yesterday. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Arizona Cardinals. So Tampa Bay won 19-16 to in overtime. Um, again, a, a win is a win, but that that was that was pathetic. That, that was, I mean, come on. I can't say anything terrible about Tampa Bay's defense. I get Trace McSorley was in at quarterback. It was his first NFL start. 16 points. I don't think you're going to, that's going to keep you up at night. Uh, I was thinking it'd be around, I mean, I said 13 was what the Cardinals would get. <sighs> but Tampa Bay offensively, I, I, I've i said all season long, despite how bad they've looked, hey, listen. That's the last guy in professional sports that you bet against, and that's obviously Tom Brady. And for that reason, for the reason, you know, the Buccaneers have obviously championship pedigree. They've been here before. I said that they were a threat in the NFC. The experience, the big game uh, situations that they've been in for the last two years, they're done. They're going to win the NFC South. They're seven and eight. They'll beat Carolina next week, and if that, if I'm not mistaken, that'll clinch the division. So you know, forget about it. It's over. They'll and they can pretty much rest starters in Week 18 against Atlanta. 
they'll win the AFC, the NFC South. They're the best team in the NFC South. I'm still not ruling out that they could still beat Dallas. Are they are they better than Dallas? Absolutely not. But I've seen Dallas in the playoffs. They tend to beat themselves and give Tom Brady the ball back with two minutes left. They're not going to win that game. But if Dallas comes in and beats them down, okay. Like, that's forget about it. But if Tampa Bay is able to survive, make it to round two, they, they're, they're, they're not a threat. They're, they're not. Philly would destroy them. San Francisco already has destroyed them and would again if they met again. Minnesota, gosh, what the weapons those guys have. I mean, Tampa Bay couldn't move the ball down the field on a a Cardinals defense that was just ravaged. It's, it was bad without the injuries. With them, and he put up 19 points. Tom Brady was all over the place. Inaccurate, wasn't on the same page, was overthrowing guys. I mean, that's that is that's one of those games where Tom Brady looked every bit like a 45-year-old quarterback. Is he washed? No, I don't think so. Is he declining? No question. I said that after the loss that Tampa Bay had against the Baltimore Ravens. But in terms of, can this team win three straight playoff games? They haven't won three straight games all season. You're telling me they're going to win three straight games against the best teams in the NFC. They might get one just because in the event of Dallas beating themselves like they did against the Niners last year. But outside of that, and again, that's I'm still not even confident in that. They're not going anywhere in the postseason. Even if they were to survive the Cowboys, they're not getting out of the second round. The, the, this is not a team. Listen, talk about trust factor. Well, it's hard for me to trust you when you can't do the thing that matters the most in all sports. There's, there's you know, X's and O's of how to do this, but we all know sports. <laughs> you got to score more points than the other team. This team can't score. You look at their last few games uh, this season, or just all season long. We'll, we'll talk about their scoring totals all season. 19, 20, 12, 31, 21, 18, 3, 22, 16, 21, 17, 17, 7, 23, 19. What am I what am I supposed to get from this? Tampa Bay's a bad football team. They are, especially by the standards that they set the last two years. Winning the Super Bowl in 2020 and then having the number two overall seed in the NFC, just barely getting beat by the eventual champion Rams. So now this year, seven and eight. Going to make the playoffs. They're going to beat Carolina next week. If not, they'll beat Atlanta and get in. This is not a Super Bowl team. Even in the week NFC. Even with Tom Brady. Albeit an older Tom Brady, but still one we thought about we could trust at this stage of his career. They can't score. Tom's inaccurate. They can't run the ball. Mike Evans hasn't had a touchdown since week four. Tom Bowles. And I love Todd Bowles. I think Todd Bowles is a great defensive coordinator. He's not half the head coach Bruce Arians was. And I get there was a lot of friction between Brady and Arians. Brady needed Arians. Offensive coach. Helped along with Byron Leftwich, obviously. This, this is a disaster. What I saw last... I mean, if you tell me, all right. Beat up Cardinals defense. Trace McSorley, who's a third stringer who's never started a game in the NFL, and Cliff Kingsbury, who's reportedly going to resign at the end of the season. And if he weren't going to resign, he'd be fired. A four-win Cardinals team with absolutely nothing to play for. Matter of fact, they benefit more by losing. It took a walk-off field goal in overtime, and he failed to score 20 points. Bucks are done. I, I'm officially selling my stock of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Not going to get much for it. I kept it because I felt like this is a, a sneaky, dangerous team. A team that is going to get a home playoff game. They're not going anywhere. Sell my stock at Tampa. They're, they're done. They may win a playoff game just because Dallas is probably it could shoot itself in the foot. We've seen this over and over again for the last 27 years. But if that doesn't happen, they're done. Totally done. Again, if, you, if your best hope to win a playoff game 
is hoping the other team screws up. Forget about it. It's over. Um, after the Cardinals, again, an admirable effort. I mean, props to Trace McSorley. Kept his team in the game. Helped to get to overtime. Made some nice throws. But uh, look, Arizona's a, a four-win team. They're going to have a high draft pick. They're, they're, they're not going anywhere. Now, only NBA topic of the day. I really wanted to talk about this one. We had five games yesterday. None of them were close up until that. Unless I stayed up watching the Denver Phoenix game. I mean, crazy. Aaron Gordon had the dunk of the season, without a doubt. Nikola Jokic was amazing. A 41 point triple double. Jamal Murray was good. It was an entertaining game, despite the fact that the Suns obviously lost Devin Booker early. Uh, Jason Tatum outdueled Giannis. In the second game, that was kind of the, the, the biggest game of Christmas. Two best teams in the league as we stand today. Earlier, the 76ers took care of the Knicks. The Mavericks had a 51-point quarter against the Lakers uh, to win that game. Obviously, Christian Wood was great. But I want to focus on the primetime game. A game that didn't have as much steam as we thought it would. Excuse me, when the schedule was made. But nevertheless, a lot of tension. So... The Golden State War, my Golden State Warriors, rather, without Steph Curry, riding a streak where they've lost five of their, out of their last six, all of them coming on the road in the East Coast, after getting beat by 38 against the New York Knicks, and after trailing by 40 points at halftime against the Brooklyn Nets, without Steph Curry, beat the team who was tied at the time for the number one overall seed, the Memphis Grizzlies. So, I'm glad I'm talking about this today, and I'm so happy about the result, because Memphis was talking a lot of smack when Steph got hurt. That's why the, the smack talk didn't start until Steph pulled a shoulder and was ruled out for essentially a month. Then they got to join. Then, with the Warriors struggling on defense, getting blown out by the Knicks and the the Kyrie, you know, no Kyrie. Of course, the Nets are better without Kyrie. I keep forgetting that. But the Nets knock out Golden State in the first quarter. Game's over after 12 minutes. Maybe even before that. Philadelphia dominates them. We're talking a lot. John Morant last week. Do I have the quote here? John Morant last week when talking uh, about the Western Conference and who's a threat to Memphis. He said, quote, the Celtics in terms of teams that could threaten them. He was asked, oh, no one in the West? John Morant, quote, nah, I'm fine in the West. So Memphis is talking a lot for a team that's won one playoff series. I get it, they're young. Highly exciting to watch, and I love John Morant. I'm not as high on him as Zion. I still think Zion's going to pan out and have the better NBA career. I've said that since 2019. But John is a remarkable talent. Uh, and it's helped change the culture of Memphis. But I got a kick out of them talking about essentially dancing on the Warriors' graves. Um, and the fact of the matter is, despite all the talking that the Memphis Grizzlies did, it was my Warriors who got the better end of it. And as this uh, photo I'm about to pull up here of, of Clay Thompson shows, here you go on Dylan Brooks. Hits a jumper over Brooks in the fourth quarter and is literally sliding and trolling his behind. Literally, as he's on the ground, Klay Thompson's dancing. He obviously got a technical for it. There's a lot of technicals handed out. Draymond Green got one. Uh, I think Jonathan Kaminga got one. Jordan Poole got two. Clay got one. There's a lot of, lot of animosity between these two teams. They don't like each other. And like Clay was talking about after the game, he said, you know, they were talking a lot, a lot of dynasty for a team that's never won before. And he said, listen, a dynasty's hard. Winning four championships, winning one championship's hard. Win four in an eight-year span? Trying to go back-to-back -back for the second time? It's hard to do. And this is why I said, I'm not writing the Warriors off. When the whole world was, I'm not. First of all, Steph Curry's going to be back. Andrew Wiggins is also going to be back soon. Hopefully by tomorrow when they play... I think Golden State plays Charlotte, maybe? is it, They play the Hornets? Yeah, they play the Hornets tomorrow night in the Bay Area. This is an eight-game homestand that they've got here. Should get Wiggins back soon. Draymond was great last night. Double-digit rebounds and assists. 
Clay scored 24, pulled before his ejection at 32 and was cooking. It was a pool party on Christmas Day. You don't hear that often. Dante DiVincenzo was great off the bench. Ty Jerome was scoring. Looney did a solid job, as did James Wiseman. It means the young guns stepped up. Props to them. And, and, and so, but it, it's kind of, I, I have the same outlook on the Warriors as John Morant has on his Memphis Grizzlies. Like, as a Warriors fan, who scares me in the West? Who haven't we beat? We've beaten everybody that's ever been in our way the last eight years in the Western Conference. Memphis, yeah, beat them last year. Denver, now Denver's going to be more a threat this year with Murray and, and Porter back and some of the other pieces they have there, but Denver looks really good right now. I love, obviously, along with Nikola Jokic. Clippers, crap, I don't know if Kawhi and Paul are going to be healthy. When did, when did Kawhi and Paul George ever share the same court? Rarely. Can't build any chemistry like that. I've been high in the Clippers since before the season. Phoenix? Phoenix has got to worry about themselves. You see the animosity between Monty Williams and DeAndre Ayton that's been going for a good year now? they got to fix themselves before they worry about Golden State. Dallas? Stop Luka and you're good. Or let Luka get his and, and, and dare the others to beat you. Losing Jalen Brunson, by the way. Now, again, all of this, there are deals made at the deadline, I'm sure. But again, the Warriors are still reportedly in the market for Alex Caruso of the Bulls. Now, the Bulls are winning as of late. I want that to, you know, no offense to my man, John Rivera. Shout out to him. Uh, know some other Bulls fans, but like, stop the winning, please. Because I want Alex Caruso. I want y'all sell him to us. Uh, Jakob Pertl on the bad San Antonio Spurs is reportedly uh, linked to the Warriors. So we'll see what happens there. But... I got a kick out of it, the fact that Memphis was talking and talk all, even during the offseason, despite the fact that we were the champions. Four rings. And there was a there was a, a picture. I don't have it on the show, but there's a picture of uh, Dylan Brooks going at Draymond Green. Dylan Brooks is going at everybody. For a guy who's an offensive liability and gets cooked by the elite guardians of this league regularly, he was talking a lot for a guy that's never done anything in this league. Point being, he was talking to Draymond, and Draymond just held the four fingers. Like, dude. You, you can't talk to us. The only true rival in this dynasty the Warriors have ever had was the Cavs when they had LeBron James. That was it. That was the only team that ever truly threatened Golden State. OKC did for a year, but some of that, we knew Oklahoma City would kind of implode themselves. KD struggled that series. Russell obviously struggled in that series. The bench wasn't great. Steve Kerr out coached Billy Donovan. And the two-time MVP Steph Curry was there with, at the time, a prime Clay Thompson. Again, I say for my Warriors, and I said it last week, even when we hit rock bottom, who scares me in the West? Who am I supposed to look at in the West and say, oh, watch out for them? Nobody. Just a reminder that the Golden State Warriors under Steve Kerr have never lost a playoff series in the Western Conference. Never. They play some really good teams. Talk about those Houston teams, Oklahoma City, San Antonio. Uh, who else? They had a good Portland team one year. Can't beat him. Forget about it. Uh, Patrick Brown says, Memphis can't talk about Dynasty if they haven't won a title. They were humbled by Golden State. When's the next time that Golden State and Memphis play? I'm checking my phone. I think they play in January, maybe, in the Bay Area. Hold on. Look at that. Look at the Grizzly schedule. Looking for a Warriors logo. They play Golden State on Wednesday, January 25th. And that game's on ESPN, by the way. And that's going to be in the Bay Area. And so at that point, Steph Curry should be back. Uh, certainly hoping for health for the Grizzlies and the Warriors because I want to see that. I want to see both teams fully healthy, ready to go. I, I got to see this again because, again, I, lo I love the animosity between these two teams. I heard a Stephen A. Smith talking about after the game. Like, can we get more of this? Can we get more? Like, I think that's probably the NBA's biggest problem is they don't have enough uh, rivalries in the league. NFL's got a ton of rivalries. Uh, college football is plenty. Heck, baseball has some rivalries. NBA doesn't really have that many. If the closest thing we have is Warriors-Grizzlies, it's not really a rivalry because the Grizzlies have done nothing in the playoffs and we've got four championships. So G Grizzlies got to get a couple of rings before they can talk anything about dynasty or even rivalry with Golden State. But I want to see this more. And can we stop? Can, I just want to get this out here there too refs I, i'm not one who blames refs you guys know that i don't i don't do that refs cost us the game no 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 
you played, refs are going to make bad calls, just like you're going to miss shots, miss defensive assignments, foul. It happens. But I'm all over the refs on this one. Can we stop with the cheap technicals, please? If someone, if you're going to give someone a technical, make them earn it. Make them earn it. Draymond Green's got a lot of technicals in the NBA that he has earned and then some, right? We, we've seen that plenty of times. But it's like every little thing last night. Boop, tech. Unsportsmanlike, it's like, no, this is basketball and we don't like each other. We're going to tell each other we don't like each other. It's part of the fun. That's why we like it. Now, if there's fisticuffs or anything, or, or if uh, a guy is, you know, dog cussing a ref, yeah, it's a technical. But this cheap stuff, I mean, Jordan Poole got thrown out of a game because he stared at a ref. Come on, man. Like, we got, we got to stop with this. It, it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten soft. It's, it's gotten really soft. We, we got to stop with this. So, but looking forward to January 25th. I'll say that again. I hope my Warriors are healthy. I hope the Grizzlies are healthy because I want to see this. Do they play? How many more times? I think they play four times against the Warriors this season. The Grizzlies do. Uh, so obviously that's the 25th matchup. February, they've got Golden State. No, they don't have Fe Golden State February. Uh, they play the Warriors on Thursday, March 9th in Memphis. And then they play again in Memphis about a week later on Saturday, March the 18th. So first two in Golden State, next two in Memphis. There's no question in my mind, this team's these two teams are going to meet in the Western Conference Finals. This is going to be a long series. Memphis is a very talented basketball team. But something that's gotten a little underreported in clutch time, John Morant's one of the worst players in the NBA. He has never made a three in the last five minutes of a game that's within five points. By the way, that's clutch time. Five-point game within five minutes. He's shooting around 30% from the field with a boatload of turnovers. Like Memphis, well-coached and talented, they don't do well late in games. And we saw that in the playoffs last year against Golden State. If the game, the, the series went six games. Four of the six came down to the last five minutes. Golden State took three of them. I'm telling you, man, in any sport, I don't care if it's baseball, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, whatever. Situational uh, awareness and being great late in games is so, so crucial and important. Golden State is probably better than anybody in the league at that. Memphis, among the good teams at least, is one of the worst. So, I anticipate my Warriors going to get hot here. I, I, I say we go, who we got? We got Hornets, Jazz, Blazers, Hawks, Pistons, Magics, Suns on this eight-game homestand. I say we go six and two. I say we go six and two, get back to a winning record, get a, a game uh, above 500. Hopefully, Steph Curry can return at least in the back half of this eight-game home stretch pretty soon. So I got the news on Christmas Eve that he was going to be reevaluating in two weeks. He said he's lifting weights. He's now uh, getting shoot around in the gym. So Steph should be back soon. Expect the Warriors to get hot around February ish. And we'll be, we'll be right back where we belong. Back to back championships incoming to golden state. You can mark that right now. Moving back to the NFL. So I knew Coming into the 2021 NFL draft, that Mac Jones was not a very good quarterback. His play over the first two seasons of his career has been more than enough for me to say that I was right about that. What I didn't know coming into last week was that Mac Jones is kind of a cruddy teammate, as evidenced by his constant outburst at coaches and teammates. And Julian Edelman and Vince Wilfork, as I talked about last Friday's show. Uh, we're talking about that as well. What I didn't know coming to today or yesterday was that Mac Jones was a dirty player. There's plenty of evidence to back this up. So Patriots are in a close game. I thought Cincinnati was going to blow them out. Uh, it's kind of surprised me a little bit. They did cover, though, to their credit. But they're in a close game with Cincinnati. Six minutes left. Mac Jones, uh, I'll show you the play in just a second, but a very careless pass. They ruled it a fumble. Uh it ended up being called incomplete because Mac Jones' arm was moving forward. But Bengals pick it up, return. It's initially called in the field of fumble, so they're obviously taking it back. And the linebacker who returns it is, is way ahead of the play. Eli Apple is trailing him, the corner for the Bengals. Mac Jones is not going to catch the linebacker. And he undercuts, takes Eli Apple's legs out from underneath him. We'll show you the play right here. Is this Here we go. So here you go, Mac Jones being really careless with the balls. He's been all season long, gets pressured, flips it in the air. It's an incomplete pass, but they called it a fumble at the time. 
Here goes the linebacker. Watch Mac Jones. Boom. Takes Eli Apple's legs out from underneath him. If you haven't seen four, here you go again. I mean, come on. What, like, what are we doing here? If that's not dirty, I don't know what dirty is. I, I don't. And you say, well, well, Bryce, come on. Like, that's, that's, that's what's one game. Like, it's one play, and one guy doesn't make you a dirty player. Agreed. But I've got evidence, plenty of evidence. So here you go. How about last year gets Carolina? Mac Jones drops back, gets strip sacked by Brian Burns. Look what he does to Brian Burns. Twists his ankle. Brian Burns does not have the football yet. He grabs his leg, twists his ankle. He's out for the rest of the game. And then earlier this season against the Chicago Bears. Here it is. He takes off running against Chicago. I didn't know Mac Jones could run. Slides and kicks the sensitive parts of the linebacker for the Bears. Boom. You got to be kidding me. Like, once you put together a history, it's what you are. You know, as, you know we talk as, 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 as when we talk about players, you are what the tape says you are. If you are constantly cheap shotting guys, you're a dirty player. No ifs, you're a dirty football player. And what's it's incredible, it's we don't really talk about quarterbacks being dirty. I mean, I, I didn't know Mac Jones was like Vontez perfect, but at the quarterback position. But this way is so he's he's obviously a terrible quarterback. He's inaccurate. He's got a noodle arm. He's he's immobile. Not so much he's a terrible leader, and he cheap shots guys. Like, he's got a history of this, and the NFL reportedly is looking into this to find him. They need to suspend him for one game. This is a this is a one-game suspendable offense. No question. Listen, Mike Evans and and um Marshawn Lattimore getting into a, a, a you know getting into fisticuffs in the middle of a game all the way back in week two. That's a one, you know, that's if that's a one-game suspension, just get into a fist fight with a guy who has pads and a helmet on, then taking a guy's legs out from underneath him when he doesn't even have the ball, that's a suspendable offense. There's there's no way if Sands are butts about it. We twist Brian Burns' ankle last year, kicks the private parts of, uh, of the, the, the Chicago Bears linebacker this year on a slide when you don't have to throw your leg up, but he did. And now this year, just falling at the feet and taking out Eli Apple. It's ridiculous. If this is a one game suspension, then I don't know what is. I don't know. I don't know what a, a one game suspendable offense is. It's a dirty play. It's a dangerous play. Could have ended Eli Apple's season. It's just, uh, come on. Good comparison, Patrick. He says Grayson Allen type of plays. That's what Mac Jones is. He's the Grayson Allen of the NFL. Like overrated at, at, at a big school. Remember, you know, Grace Allen at Duke, Mac Jones at Alabama were productive simply because the system around them was, you know, headed by the greatest coaches in the history of their sports. But, but when they're not getting by on their highly limited talent, you know, in the case of Grace and Allen, he's either tripping guys or dirty, hard fouls up in the air. In Mac Jones's case, basically trying to, to end guys' seasons by... You know, jumping into guys' legs, uh, you know, twisting guys' ankles, or kicking somebody where he shouldn't be kicking them. He's got a history of this. Like, eventually, if if you keep showing us this, it's who you are. It's who you are as a player. And, you know, obviously the season's been a disaster for the Patriots. If, if listen, I have been, there's teams I've been dead wrong about. The Broncos, the Rams, I underestimate the Eagles. But, man, two teams I hit the nail on the head on. Minnesota and New England. I said New England before the season would go into Thanksgiving Day, against the Vikings, by the way, with six wins. They would exit the season with seven and miss the playoffs easily. This, this is not a playoff team. Listen, props them for staying in the game, fighting against the Bengals. They got a lucky touchdown pass on a deflection that made it a one-score game. Um, but once again, by the way, shifting to Belichick, I mean, how many times the Patriots going to look bad in situational football? Again, it's talking about situational football. That's what feels like it was more Tom Brady than Belichick now, doesn't it? Because Belichick's been a mess late in games without number 12. At the simplest of stuff. So, yeah, New England's not making the playoffs, and uh, their quarterback is a, a cheap shot artist, to say the very least. Uh, 
Let's see. All right, so looking at the other games real quick, recap the rest of the NFL. So I went out on a limb, picked the Bears to win over the Bills. Uh, they they opened the game with a touchdown, but uh, Josh Allen in obviously frigid temperatures, as it was around the country, uh, dominated the Chicago Bears defense, was was outstanding. 35-13 went for the Bills to, for now, keep them as the number one overall seed in the uh, AFC. Saints beat the Browns this week uh, in frigid temperatures. Alvin Kamara was great. Uh, had that touchdown run. Defense played well against Deshaun Watson, the Browns. Chiefs in frigid temperatures. This is becoming a theme. Patrick Mahomes, three touchdowns, two through the air, one on the ground against a solid Seahawks defense in frigid temperatures. Listen, I've been saying all year long he's the MVP. I don't I don't know what, what, how much more evidence you need. The, the guy is, is just, I've never seen like him. None of us have. I mentioned earlier, Vikings beat the Giants on a 61-yard walk-off field goal in what was the best-looking environment in the NFL this weekend. The whiteout in Minnesota with the white uniforms, the white Vikings logo, and the white end zones was awesome. Like, the Vikings need to bring that back for the playoffs. That is so cool. I loved watching that. It was like, wasn't Penn State good, but it was good. Um, Kirk Cousins was excellent yesterday. Another game-winning drive. This time, he gets a very good Giants defense. And uh, not a devastating loss for the Giants. They're not going to catch Dallas for the five seed anyway. They look to be pretty much locked in as the six. Uh, who the Giants finish with? They've got the Colts, who they'll beat, and they got the Eagles, who may have nothing to play for by that point. So Giants still could finish with 10 wins. Uh, Minnesota, though, seem like they'll be worst case the two seed in the NFC. What do we got? Panthers beat down the Lions. I did not see this one coming. Sam Darnold was great. Uh, what, what was what did he finish with? A really He had a great QBR. 85 QBR, 121 passer rating. He's put him like DAC numbers. He was great against Detroit. And that's really the weakness of the Lions. They do not have a good pass defense at all. And uh, props to the Panthers and Sam Darnold for taking advantage. Ravens beat the Falcons 17-9. to um, Again, Ravens offense looks absolutely anemic without Lamar Jackson. What's happened to Lamar Jackson is similar to what happened to Dak Prescott in 2020 where you're on a contract year. In Dak's case, he was on a franchise tag. You get hurt, and the offense literally cannot move the football without you. And you not playing is actually boosting your case to get a big deal. Uh, Ravens could sure use Lamar Jackson right now. The Texans upset the Titans 19-14. to Davis Mills game winning drive. Malik Willis really struggled. Uh, Derrick Henry was, you know, listen, they, he had 126 yards, had a big one in the first quarter, but some some key takeaways by the Houston Texans. And again, next week for Tennessee and for Jacksonville means absolutely nothing. Because win, win, lose, or draw, it's going to come down to Week 18 to decide the AFC South. Uh, I'm pulling for Jacksonville just because I'd rather see Jacksonville in the playoffs. I'd rather see Trevor Lawrence than Malik Willis. But we'll see what happens over the, the coming two weeks. Uh, Niners beat the Commanders 37-20. Brock Purdy was great once again. A funny stat that I saw the other day, if I can pull it up here. Uh, about Brock Purdy and and how clearly Kyle Shanahan trusts him a heck of a lot more than he trusts Jimmy G. Do we have it here? I think this is it. All right. According to NFL Next Gen Stats, Brock Purdy is the fourth player with a pass touchdown of 30-plus air yards with the 49ers since 2020. He joins Trey Lance, C.J. Beathard, and Christian McCaffrey. I don't see Jimmy Garoppolo. They don't throw the ball deep with Jimmy G. They do with Purdy. Not to mention Purdy is more mobile than Jimmy G. I'm not saying he's better than Garoppolo. I am saying he's better suited for the Niners offense. We've seen through three games. Kid looks good. I'm not going to come out and say he's a franchise quarterback or anything because he does have the best supporting cast in football. But this offense looks even more dynamic with him than it did with Garoppolo. Good win for the Niners. Commanders, by the way, switched from Heineke to Wentz, who looked actually pretty good in garbage time. We'll see who they go with the quarterback next week against Cleveland. And Steelers beat the Raiders 13-10. to uh, I, I was so close in the final score. It drove me crazy. I had the Steelers 14-10 to before the game. They ended up winning by one less point than that. But a game-winning drive. Kenny Pickett to George Pickens. I get used to hearing that for a while. Uh, pretty much ending the Raiders season. They're done. Derek Carr, my man. I love Derek Carr. Barely less than I love Dak Prescott, but he was terrible. I'll be as a good Steelers defense in frigid temperatures, but man, some of those, that last interception, that was awful. Uh, what else did we have? Oh, yeah, and then I mentioned all the Christmas games. So there you go. Got a comment here from Patrick. 
Uh, yes, uh, Steelers Ravens flex to Sunday Night Football as well for Week 17. Yes, uh, it was initially Rams Chargers, but obviously the Rams are not going to make the playoffs. The Chargers could lock up their spot tonight, which I'm about to predict. But uh, yeah, Ravens and Steelers is all of a sudden a very big game. Ravens are still in the hunt for the division. If they win next week, it'll ensure that they'll have a shot in Week 18 against Cincinnati, which will be a, a very big game. Hopefully, Lamar's back by that point. Well, he might even be back for Sunday. We'll see. And the Ravens, I'm sorry, the Steelers are not dead yet. And these two teams always play close ones. Down to the wire, low scoring, defensive battles. But this should be an interesting one from Baltimore, Maryland on Sunday night. But we got a game to finish week 16 of the NFL, to finish this beautiful Christmas holiday weekend. Hope everybody out there had a great uh, Christmas. Uh, uh, today's Hanukkah, by the way. So I hope everybody, uh, you know, those who uh, observe and celebrate uh, are enjoying that as well. So we got a game tonight. Los Angeles Chargers, uh, who are taking on the uh, Indianapolis Colts, uh, two teams that are really in position. Whoops. Two, two teams that are uh, in a, a very different position. The Colts are basically done, not officially eliminated, but uh, they're they're done. Okay, guys, like they're, they're, their goose is cooked. As for the Chargers, they can make the playoffs. They are three-point favorites in this game. Uh, in Indianapolis, as for the Chargers, Justin Herbert's playing out of his mind right now. Another game-winning drive last week to beat the Tennessee Titans with some just outstanding throws. He made that last one to, I think it was Mike Williams, uh, to get them in the field goal range. And my man Dicker, the kicker, Cameron Dicker, made the walk-off field goal his fourth of the season for the Chargers. They're 8-6. and six. They clinch a playoff spot tonight with a W. What I'm looking at is this. The Colts have gotten off to solid starts in games this season. Got off to a good start against the Cowboys, against the Steelers, against the... Obviously got up to an amazing start against the Vikings last week, up 33 zip. But this feels to me like a team that is psychologically messed up. Matt Ryan's benched. Jonathan Taylor, the best player on the team, is out for the season with an ankle injury. Uh, Jeff Saturday, his teams have been outscored, I think, 83-9 to in fourth quarter since he arrived in, in Indianapolis. It, it's been a disaster. These are the type of the games the Chargers tend to lose. So, you know, I'm a little hesitant on this. But considering a Colts defense that is struggling badly, missing a lot of starters, including Sha uh, Shaq Leonard, a Chargers, D a Chargers offense, uh, might rather, that's getting healthier by the day, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Josh Palmer. He's got some really good weapons. Austin Eckler, by the way. That uh, 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 Kelly kid, Josh Kelly, is really good. I like what I'm seeing for the Chargers right now. I think they win this game fairly convincingly. 34-16 to 16 over the Indianapolis Colts. Listen, I like Nick Foles like the next guy, St. Nick. But uh, the, I'm not. I, I'm not seeing this one. Chargers win this game pretty comfortably. Cover the three and a half point spread, 34 to 16 over the Indianapolis Colts to close out Week 16 in the NFL. How fast is time flying by? That is all the time we have for today's show. I appreciate everybody stopping by as always. Be sure to catch Carving It Up Live on Thursday night at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook Live, YouTube, and on Twitter. And be sure to like, share, comment, and take two seconds out of your day. Hit that big red subscribe button. Subscribe to the Carving It Up YouTube channel and hit the notification bell. Get notified anytime we upload uh, videos, YouTube shorts, or obviously when we go live on Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Also, be sure to subscribe to the Grid Podcast Network. That is G-R-Y-D. Here you go. Here's the logo for the streaming audience. The Grid Network on YouTube, which is where you can find my show, as well as the incredible other creators of other incredible shows. Patrick Brown, you saw in the comments today. The Chaotic Sports Podcast, Ryan Flowers commented today. Shout out to Ryan as well. Clutch Sports Talk. Barry Grant Jr., he just put out a new, new podcast. Great episode. Check it out. All Even Podcast. Alfred Parsar Jr., Rocket Fuel Jets Podcast. And the Cowboys Cam Fan Podcast. My friends over there in Canada. Shout out to those guys as well. I, I know they're very, very excited after the Cowboys win over the Eagles. So uh, be sure to catch Carving Up Live Thursday, 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific Time. Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter. Also, The Grid is where you can listen to Carving It Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to your podcast. Hope everybody had an amazing Christmas and holiday weekend. Uh, see, like I said, the stream out, it's rocking this new Dak hat. Shout out to my grandmother for, for giving me this. She knows me well. She knows me well. She knows I love Dak Prescott. So I appreciate this. Shout out, shout out to Nana. She's a big supporter of the show. 
Uh, she also, by the way, got me this uh, Dak Prescott bobblehead. So there you go. She's contributed mightily uh, to the, to carving it up. So appreciate her. Appreciate everybody uh, out there celebrating this past weekend. Have a great week, everybody. Continue to stay safe out there. God bless you all. Please take care of your mental health. Peace out. Rain Dakota Press. Thanks so much for watching the show on YouTube. Be sure to click that big red subscribe button and go check out the other clips and full shows of Carving It Up Live. Have a blessed day.